Good morning, everyone. So I've seen many of you already this morning for a few hours. We're going to talk today about capacitors. And remember, it's important to be staying up to speed with the textbook. Right? There's lots of things, given infinite amount of time, I'd love to talk about in class, I don't have time to talk about everything, I'm trying to bring the main physics concepts into the class. All right, so let's go back and quickly review where we were last class. And where we were last class was electrostatic equilibrium. And we learned some interesting things about how charges arrange themselves. We learned that charge, excess charge, wants to sit on the surface of a conductor and arrange itself in such a way that it cancels out the internal electric fields. It will create an electric field which is perpendicular to its surface and the strongest electric field will always be at the sharpest point. So that's why you can use a needle to get a corona discharge. That's why lightning rods will kind of act as a field guide to channel electric charge discharge into a particular part of uh, the building, like the lightning strike rod. So looking at our Van der Graaff generator, this is also how a Van der Graaff generator really works. It's through corona discharge. So the mechanical belt that is being driven is stripping charge off of the roller and the belt by the triboelectric effect. And then what we have happening is a needle is causing electrons to discharge onto the needle. Um, and that needle could be positively positively or negatively charged, depending on whether or not you wanted the top sphere to be positive or negatively charged. So the belt then discharges again onto the needle. The reason it does that is because that's where most of the charge likes to gather up around those corners. Right? When you're at a corner, you don't, you don't have this many nearest neighbors, so the charge can kind of pile up at a sharp corner. So take out your voting cards. Let's apply this principle to the following situation. <coughs> Does anyone remember what this thing is? <coughs> electroscope, excellent. Now this electroscope is negatively charged. Take a moment to prepare your vote. <coughs> Three, and I'll have you show on the count of three. Three, two, one. Take 30 seconds. Try to convince your neighbor. Kind of converged at yellow, they are equal. The reason that the leaf is equal to the post is because it's a conductor in electrostatic equilibrium. Electro, electric potential difference is what drives the flow of charge, so charge keeps flowing until uh, it's equal potential everywhere on the surface. Alright, let's look at another example here where I have two spheres and you'll have a homework problem like this, but I'm just going to talk about the uh, uh, first part here. You have a switch that's open. Close the switch. Which one 
has a larger electric potential after the switch is closed. Prepare your vote. Three, two, one. Equal, excellent. They should be equal because if they weren't equal, think of electric potential like pressure, electrical pressure. So charge is going to flow until there's equal amounts of electric pressure on either side. Now, just for fun here, let's try which one has more charge. Take a moment to think about this. Prepare your vote. OK, 30 seconds. Convince your neighbor. Okay, prepare your vote. And let's show our cards. A is correct. So sphere number one has more charge on it. What? Why is that? Can anyone help us understand why? How do we know that the first sphere has more charge? Yes? Uh, well, if you treat V like it's like electrical pressure, then the pressure is equal and the surface is greater than one, then it has to have more charge. OK, because there's more room, in a sense, for the charge to spread out. Excellent. And I could write this mathematically. We already said that V1 equals V2. And for a charged sphere, it looks like a point charge outside. So we could write, we could write uh, KQ1 over R1 equals KQ2 over R2. And since R1 is greater than R2, if I solve this for Q1, I really just get a ratio of the, uh, so if the sphere is twice as big, or uh, if its radius is twice as big, then it's going to have twice as much charge, right? If its radius is twice as big, its area is how many times bigger? Sur surface area of the sphere would be four times bigger if the radius is twice as big. But there's only twice as much charge. There's not four times as much charge. Why might that be? Yes? Right, now which one has a, so, but, but we're, when we're talking area, we're, we're, we're talking this one has four times the area if it's twice the radius, um, but it only has twice as much charge. So another factor to consider here it has to do with the electric field, right? Because which one would have a stronger electric field between one and two? Two, why two? It's a sharper core. It's like a, well, yeah, we could write the electric field for a sphere outside looks like a point charge. It would be KQ over R squared. This is, this is for a point charge, which is the same thing for a sphere, which if we compare that to what the potential is for a point charge, this is like V uh, over R. Now, if we have a smaller radius, constant potential, we have a larger electric field. So anytime you have a sharper corner, you're going to have a larger electric field. And in particular, for a conductor, well, that, that would be the idea here. It, it, it's, it's more tightly curved. You can <clears throat> have a larger electric field. All right, so let's look now. So this is review from last day. <coughs> 
electrostatic equilibrium. So now what we want to talk about today is build into capacitors a little bit farther here. All right. So capacitance and capacitors. So the farad is the unit, is the SI unit of uh, capacitance. So I write C or Q equals C delta V. The units here, farad, one farad <coughs> is equal to one coulomb per volt. And capacitance is a measure of the ability of a capacitor of uh, really a dipole, a macroscopic dipole to store charge. Now they come in all different shapes and sizes. And what I'll do is I'll pass around a few mounted to a board here just for you to have a look at here. So here's an aluminum electrolytic capacitor. I have a metallized polyester film, plastic dielectric ceramic, PVC and tantalum different ones I'll pass around here for you can take a look at what they actually look like. All right, now, for instance, a lot of keyboards are uh, capacitors. And uh, since it's a geometric quantity, it depends on how those electrodes are arranged. So one of the ones that we're going to talk a lot about or really just focus on is the parallel plate. For the parallel plate capacitor, which we might give the symbol, <coughs> just drawing it as two parallel plates like this, its capacitance C is just epsilon naught A over D. Now what happens if you decrease the distance? increase the capacitance. That's what's happening on a keyboard stroke. You're actually pushing capacitor plates closer together, uh, increasing the capacitance, uh, and then you can get voltage readings and uh, uh, communicate with your communicate with your computer. All right. Take out your cards. Here's a capacitor which is connected to a voltmeter. What's the capacitance of this capacitor? Those are kind of funny shaped. This, is, this wouldn't be a parallel plate capacitor. It's still a capacitor though. Positive and negatively charged. And that box in the middle there is a voltmeter just measuring the potential difference between them. Prepare your votes. And on the count of three, we'll go three, two, one. Okay, 30 seconds, convince your neighbor. Okay, prepare your votes. And on the count of three, three, two, one, C is correct, right? Just really, this is really just a definition question of what we mean by capacitance. Now, this number, you know, for simple geometric configurations, you can calculate theoretically, like this expression here. For a real capacitor, like the ones that are being passed around, you'd want to measure it. Uh, it would be hard to predict exactly what it's going to be ahead of time. Uh, although you could use the understanding of what a capacitor is to get it to uh, make a good prediction. Now, what do you do with a capacitor? Well, you want to charge it up. You want to charge a capacitor. And the way that you charge a capacitor is by connecting it to a battery. Now, a battery, as pictured here, is really nothing more than a pump of charge. Right? Or we can think of it as a charge escalator. There's an electrolytic chemical reaction between the terminals of the battery which lift the positives off of the negative. 
and deposited, that, deposited them on the positive electrode of the battery, and that causes a increase in electric potential at the top, thereby pushing charge onto the positive plate of the capacitor. So this process continues, continues until more and more charge builds up on the capacitor and there's an equal pressure once your capacitor plate has reached the same electric potential as the battery, right? it can't charge it anymore beyond that. So the battery is like a pump, but once the pressure up top equals the same, press, equals the same pressure gradient exerted by the battery, then the charge escalator shuts down, basically, is what happens. Now, so what determines how much charge can actually be stored on a capacitor well, let's look at a let's look at uh, uh, an example here, where here's a here's a capacitor, parallel plate capacitor. Right now, as I increase voltage, the battery is pushing more and more charge onto the positive plate, and then I can change the amount of <coughs> charge that's stored on the plate by changing the geometry of the plate, either how far the plates are apart or the area of the uh, individual plates. All right, so let's look at an example here where, let's say, as the following case shows, let's say I have a capacitor that's been connected to a battery for a long time. So here's the circuit picture for battery plus and minus connected to a capacitor for a long time. Let's say these plates have a separation of one millimeter. And I'm going to label, I'm going to say this battery is three volts. A three volt difference between the positive and the negative terminal. Now the purpose of a battery is to maintain an electric potential difference of 3 volts or 6 volts or 9 volts or whatever the battery happens to be. That would be a good design. So let me label a couple points in the circuit. I'll call 1, 2, 3, 4, and then the fifth point is just a point in space that's right in between the two plates of the capacitor. So I want you to find, first of all, delta V12, delta V23, and delta V34. So this is a capacitor <coughs> connected for a long time. <laughs>